Do you not have enough condescension in your life? Were your teachers too nice to you? And did they treat you too much like a dignified human being? Well, if I got the channel for you, introducing No Better. So if that intro didn't just warm your heart, uh, let me preface this by saying that this entire video is basically a response to a response. Um, and I, I, I'm waiting for the copyright strikes. So if you decide you like what I have to say, feel free to support me by any of the links in the description. And uh, thank you if you decide to, because I know this channel's gonna get demonetized for talking shit the way people used to in 2010. But either way, on the annual masturbatory celebration of Columbus, uh, I did what I always do, which was post things negative about him. And one person in particular, who I'm not going to mention by name, uh, happened to bring up a video that he claimed completely debunked my revisionism and, like, destroyed all anti-Columbus arguments, proving that he was not the hero or the villain people say he was. And I, uh, I meant to get this video out on that day, but didn't end up getting to it. Then, after all of the, the, the attempts in the world to get my previous files to look right, uh, I realized that the video was corrupted, because I meant to put out a reply to this much sooner. But basically, I was sent this video from a truly condescending channel called No Better, who I just showed you the intro of. Now, this channel claims to teach you uh, what the people, like, need to know, I guess, better, but it then goes on to completely falsify many things and be generally <laughs> unambiguously condescending and way too close to the camera. So I just, I thought that I would make an effort today to, uh... <laughs> debunk some of these bullshit claims, trying to say that Columbus wasn't just as such a bad guy as everybody claimed he was. So, this is my attempt at doing that. Uh, if you like this sort of content, feel free to subscribe, because I'm going to be posting a shit ton more of this. Uh, I am not ambiguously angry at a bunch of people for their bullshit interpretations of government politics, uh, finance, economics, and history, and I will be destroying everything that they say in what their videos amount to, which is usually a pile of garbage when I respond. So, to get to this pile of garbage, let me just start with the video as it stands, uh, because I'm going to respond to every single claim he makes. Let's roll. You probably have one of two views of Columbus. Oh, I didn't realize we were recording so close to the cameras now. Uh, I guess if your face doesn't fill most of the frame, you're not doing it right or something. I don't know. I, 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 just, I just had to comment on the fact that you're close enough to your camera that I could smell your breath if I was talking to you. It's, it's, I don't know you that well. Just saying. You might think that he was a brave explorer who proved the world was round and by doing so discovered the United States and... If that's the case, congratulations on graduating from elementary school. Now, I know every grown-up says this, but a lot of things are going to change for you. Not just for you personally, but for all the things that you think you know, so enjoy it while it lasts. But odds are, you probably think... Columbus was an incompetent buffoon who never even set foot in America. Christopher Columbus was actually an idiot and dumb dumb. He got lost coming here, and he's the one that named us Indians because he thought he was in India. He was a doofus who was terrible at math. Yes! I'm one of history's greatest monsters! Well, that's quite the contrast. Well, let's take a look at the facts and see if we can't figure out which ones have been misunderstood, misattributed, exaggerated, and sometimes straight up fabricated. Wow, that was a lot of big words. I kind of feel like Johnny Cochran, only way underpaid. Might as well start at the beginning, right? 
Columbus couldn't have discovered that the Earth was round because in his time, it was already common knowledge. A globes for sale. A perfectly ordinary globes for sale. The way Adam phrases this makes it seem like Columbus thought he was the first person to conclude that the world is round. He didn't, nor did he ever claim to. People since ancient times knew that the world was round. Nobody thought that the world was flat. Some people probably thought that the world was flat. Some people today think that the world is flat. Some people are idiots. First incorrect claim. Adam didn't say anyone thought the Earth was flat. He simply said Columbus doesn't deserve credit for discovering otherwise. He is tearing down a myth. Of course he's going to attack obviously incorrect, tropey parts of it. It'd be like me saying he can't fit through most home chimneys as part of a proof Santa isn't real. <laughs> Nobody said Santa said he could do that. He wouldn't need to. Because the myth carries the baggage, and that's what's being discussed, the myth, not the man. St. Klaus wasn't magical and couldn't fit in chimneys. Columbus didn't discover the earth was round and children shouldn't be taught otherwise. But they are. So in dissolving the veil of dumb around Columbus, it's perfectly logical and fine to bring this up and dispel it. What an asinine point. But I also want to bring attention to those perfectly ordinary globes. Globes weren't exactly common back then. In fact, this is the oldest surviving globe in the world made in 1493, completely separate from Columbus. Here's a question for you. What continent are we looking at? You don't have to answer right now, but just tuck that away in the back of your mind for now. This projection of people saying what they think Columbus thought doesn't end, especially when it's ridiculous. My math says the earth is teeny tiny and shaped like a pear. And at the top, it has a succulent nipple. He actually believed that? Yes, I actually believe this. Do I actually have to talk about this? No, he didn't think that the world was shaped like a pear with a nipple on top. In fact, I had never even heard this claim before, but luckily Adam gives us his source, who actually never says that Columbus thought that the world was shaped like a pear. In fact, she says putting all of this together, Columbus reasoned that the world was shaped like a ball with a breast-like protuberance. Second incorrect claim. A ball with a breast-like protuberance is a pear shape. Nobody should have to explain this. And Adam's caricature, totally fine and accurate in this context, he uses a pear as an analog because it's more ubiquitous than other objects. Say, some squash or gourd varieties. Let's not mince dumb details like this in a show meant to be entertaining when the original point is, for all intents and purposes, true. And the fact that they were in need of new imports doesn't change any of that. Yeah, Adam took some liberties in his description, but his point was to show that Columbus is a human, not some deity in need of a day of reverence like protuberance. On his third voyage, he wrote a rather poetic letter describing how he felt himself not just crossing the ocean, but going up it. Had he reached the very tip of the protuberance, he would have sailed straight into the terrestrial paradise. So what does he mean by that? Well, back in the day, maps were often oriented with east on top, not north. And at the very far end of the east, or on top of the map, you would find the earthly paradise, also known as the Garden of Eden. This paradise was often depicted as sitting on top of a protuberance. In one letter in 1498, Columbus ponders if this depiction of the Earth might be accurate, and then never mentions it again. The Earth is tiny, and also a pear. Give me money, please. This money's an idiot. See what he did there? He took something that Columbus poetically pondered once during his third voyage and made it look like he presented this idea to the king and queen of Spain. They didn't fund his expedition just to make him go away. The Ottomans had just defeated the Byzantines and froze Europe out of the spice trade. And since Portugal was going all in on conquering Africa, and Spain had just kicked the Moors off of their peninsula, they were ready to get in on that whole exploration and colonization game. So what about this whole thinking that the world was tiny thing that people keep repeating? Yeah. That's not true either. People knew the circumference of the Earth, more or less. Turns out Columbus went with less, but still. What they didn't know was how big the ocean was or how big Asia... Remember when I asked what continent we were looking at on that globe? It's Asia. Here's his globe projected onto a piece of paper, 
And here's a slightly less confusing version of that same projection. They thought Asia was much larger, but this isn't the guy I want to talk about because he's not really connected to Columbus. This is the map Columbus was going by, made by Toscanelli in 1474. This is China on the globe we saw earlier, and this is China on Toscanelli's map. It was Toscanelli who told Columbus, the voyage is not only possible, but it is true and certain to be honorable, and a yield incalculable profit. Miscalculate the distance to what you wrongly think is Japan, even though people have been calculating the circumference of the Earth pretty well for centuries using sticks in the ground and shadows and math. He calculates the journey from Spain will take him just 21 days. He underestimates the distance by 7,000 miles. What was striking about this is that any educated person at the time would know that Columbus was wrong. I guess by any educated person, they mean not Toscanelli, who is widely viewed as one of the great cartographers of his time, which is why Adam throws this in the background to make it look like Columbus wasn't listening to Toscanelli, when he clearly was. It's actually pretty good attention to detail that the map Columbus was pointing to in that mankind scene is Toscanelli's map. So where did they get that whole 7,000 miles off thing? This is what Columbus was aiming for, Sepangu, which is supposed to be Japan. Obviously, this isn't where Japan really is, but that is where everyone thought it was. It wasn't Columbus's calculation of the distance that was off. It was any educated person's positioning of Japan. Third incorrect claim. The thinking the Earth is tiny part is a joke aimed at the fact that Columbus simply believed someone's assertion rather than doing any real discovery. Missing a continent makes the world smaller. Humans aren't fish, and a bigger ocean doesn't make our world grow. The point is still valid, even if you don't like the jokes made alongside it. What a needle-nosed point. And I mean, come on, is it still really better that he believed someone's depiction with no proof? Or that he ran all the calculations himself? Because he still miscalculated 7,000 miles, even if his only calculation is believing someone else's. Like, yeah, if you copy someone's homework and they're wrong, you get a bad grade. Duh. Columbus was also hoping that there would be uncharted islands off of the east coast of Japan. So when he landed here, that's what he thought he found. And died thinking he had made it to India. People saying that you're not in Asia? Insist! That you are! He didn't think he was in China, he didn't think he was in India, he thought he was somewhere new. Off the coast of Japan, but still, somewhere new. Remember, he landed here, which there is no land on the map right here, so what was he supposed to think? And here are the actual land masses. Columbus landed on the island of Hispaniola, which is 7,000 miles away from Japan. That's where they got that number. So I suppose he got kind of lucky that he accidentally discovered some new land. He didn't discover America, and he didn't prove the Earth was round. Columbus was a savage man who didn't discover North America, didn't prove the Earth was round. This is something that you've heard everywhere, and it's probably already down in the comments. Whenever Adam says America, he's specifically referring to the United States, which is weird. The Some News segment is a little more honest by saying North America, which is true, he didn't land in North America. So let's talk about the guy who did, Leif Erikson. In 985, the Vikings set up two settlements in Greenland. If you didn't already know this, the name was just a sales technique to get more settlers. Greenland is very much not green, which meant that the settlers had to travel further west in order to find timber. Erikson's winter camp at Lonso Meadows, Newfoundland lasted one year before being abandoned. The Greenland settlements were mostly forgotten by the rest of Europe during the Black Plague, and they were finally abandoned in 1408. I personally have a problem with people who say that the Vikings discovered America first. Imagine it's 2010 and someone offers to sell you Bitcoin at 10 cents a piece. You decline it because it's stupid and worthless. Now it's 2017 and Bitcoin is worth $10,000 a piece. So you go around telling everyone how you could have been rich because you knew about Bitcoin back in the day, but you never did anything with it. Okay, now swap out Bitcoin for America and extend the timeline out to 500 years. The Vikings didn't discover America first. They stumbled on it looking for timber, stayed for a year, and then left. And not only did they never come back, but they just plain forgot about it. Their find amounted to nothing. Fourth incorrect claim. It isn't weird to dispel the claim that he discovered America 
Because, let me remind you, we're dispelling myths taught in school. And in school, myself and many others were taught he was important to U.S. history because he discovered America. This is rhetorically and qualitatively untrue, as what he named America is not even a part of America today. He came in, mushroom stamped a territory, and said, Behold, I discovereth. And it was already discovered by the hundreds of thousands of Tainos already there. So there's that. He didn't discover the land, and he didn't discover America. And the fact that Columbus could stumble on the Caribbean while looking for Japan and discover America by this guy's inept assessment means Leif Erikson discovered the continent first by the same token. This special pleading is trash, and if discovering America is the thing under discussion, Erikson had Bitcoin. And still has Bitcoin. He just lost his seed phrase. By the way, the Amerigo, Vespucci, and Waldsi Muller thing is the first substantive point in the video, and it doesn't even really counter anything. Next? Columbus's discovery, on the other hand, opened up both halves of the world to each other and changed world history forever. On his third voyage in 1498, he landed here, which he named the Gulf of Pariah, and then he named all of this Pariah. This is the terrestrial paradise that he was talking about in that previous letter. He describes that the land of Pariah is a mighty continent that was hitherto unknown. So not only did he know he found something new, but he was describing the South American continent. He thought that the Caribbean as well as this new continent lied to the southeast of Asia, which is also what people like Amerigo Vespucci believed. Amerigo Vespucci is an interesting character in our story, because he was full of sh he straight up made up two voyages, so historians take what he has to say with a grain of salt. But while he was in the service of Portugal in 1502, he was mapping the South American coast, and soon realized that he was further south than anything previously mapped in Asia. So he too thought that this must be a previously unknown fourth continent. But his letters don't describe huge river deltas that would have been impossible to miss if he was actually there, so... This was four years after Columbus described Pariah as a hitherto unknown continent. And just like Columbus, Amerigo thought that this new continent lied to the south of Asia. So why is it called America? The usual story goes that Amerigo beat Columbus to the punch when it came to publishing his findings, and the name was eventually settled on in 1507 by the Waldsee Mueller map. Unfortunately, it's just not that cut and dry. This is the map, the Universalis Cosmographia. And here is the new fourth continent named America, the female Latinized version of Amerigo's name. But up here to the north, we see a smaller fifth continent named Pariahs. The Latinized, you get it. Waldsee Mueller didn't settle the dispute or settle on a name. He credits both Columbus and Amerigo in the top left corner of the map. There are still a few interesting things to note on this map though, like this. This is still Sepangu, which is supposed to be Japan, and there are a number of places on the east coast of America which are also on the east coast of India, which shows that educated people still weren't sure if America and Asia were connected or not. Anyway, the name Pariahs eventually falls out of favor when they realize that North and South America are actually connected. Though even in 1587, Mercator named the northern half America, or New India? So you know, it took people a while to settle on a name. So now that we've cleared all that up, kind of, and we're in America, we need to discuss how primitive or not primitive the Native Americans were. People on both sides tend to lump all Native Americans in together. They're two huge continents spanning thousands of miles. What's true for one tribe isn't necessarily true for another. If one tribe mapped all the stars and created an almanac, that doesn't mean they all did. If one tribe didn't use the wheel, that doesn't mean they all didn't. Some of them did invent a wheel. They just didn't use them for hauling because they hadn't domesticated draft animals yet. I would have been fine with that statement until he said the word yet. This implies that given enough time, they would have eventually when... No, they wouldn't have. Ever. Not because they're intellectually inferior or anything like that, but because they had a really difficult spawn point. There are no draft animals or work or pack animals in the Americas. There are no horses, donkeys, or camels. Fifth incorrect claim. No livestock for machining. Uh, what people re commonly refer to as domesticated animals are animals that go to the poles every four... Oh, sorry, he doesn't like jokes, so I should stick to raw facts. Like how domesticated animals are ones which have been selectively bred for a specific level of servitude over several generations. It starts with taming and ends with chihuahuas. 
So for him to insist, it would have been impossible for the natives to get draft animals when Equus ferris and bison were in the region known as North America for millennia before Columbus arrived is asinine. And that's just cows and horses, which you can't get much more American than. But there are a variety of potentialities he simply ignores which might vindicate Cody Johnston's use of the word yet. Again, mincing terms, really starving for watch hours, yeah? And sure, someone's gonna bring up the Peru part and claim making it about North American horses and bison is moving goalposts. But if you consider the theory that horses, bison, and humans all came over on the Bering Land Bridge, toward which I lend significant credence, not only were those people the real discoverers of what are now the Americas, but they theoretically could have ventured north, exploring the rest of their, and I stress this, their, uh, continents to get access to domesticable animals for grunt work. The fact that they didn't doesn't mean they couldn't have. I could stab myself in the chest. I have the tools and skills. I obviously haven't yet, but we're discussing ability here. And when he said there were no cows, it's also laughable, because of course there weren't. Those are the result of domesticating taurins over many generations, things of which America's First Nations people would have been capable, and just didn't do... yet. And because of that, they hit somewhat of a cap on their civilization tech tree. You can't really have large cities without animals. In fact, with the exception of llamas and guinea pigs in Peru, they didn't have any domesticated animals. There were no cows, pigs, or chickens to share diseases with, so Native Americans were incredibly vulnerable and susceptible to disease. Again, not because of any genetic inferiority, but because of their difficult starting location. Since Europeans and Asians had been living in close proximity with animals for centuries, they had built up somewhat of an immunity to animal diseases, like cowpox, chickenpox, and the various swine and avian flus. So on Columbus's second voyage, when smallpox was introduced to the New World, it burned through the entire continent, killing 90% of the Native American population before they had even heard of a European. This was inevitable and unavoidable. Whether it was Columbus, any of the people who followed him, or even a Chinese explorer coming the other way. It was also unintentional at this point. The whole smallpox blankets thing doesn't happen until way later in the 1700s. The point is that by 1600, 90% of the native population had died. So when the first North American colonists showed up in 1607 and 1620, they found most of the land to be pretty much uninhabited. Pre-Columbian population numbers for North America vary widely, from 50 to 100 million. But everyone pretty much agrees on that 90% disease mortality number, so we're talking about 5 to 10 million people in 1600 spread across the entire continent. Before you go thinking that that's exceptionally bad, remember that 150 years before Columbus, Europe lost 50 to 60% of its population to the Black Plague. These epidemics just kind of happened. If you don't count the quarter million Taino people, people that live there already. Uh, occupied? Someone lives here? Right! I know this part! He thought he made it to India! <sighs> We've covered this already. <laughs> what a silly mistake. Yes, if by silly you mean brutal. Brutal is not a synonym for silly. Sixth incorrect claim, responding to his sarcasm about if by silly you mean brutal, with brutal is not a synonym for silly as though he didn't know that, is intentionally missing his point and strawmanning it. He never said it was. In fact, his point was that people shouldn't dismiss the mistake as silly when it's really brutal. His exact point is that they're not synonyms. The Taino treated Columbus and his crew with the utmost hospitality. Hug? Ugh. We need reinforcements! That's not how it happened. Columbus didn't freak out and go get reinforcements. On his first trip, he bounced around a few islands, left 40 people to set up a fort, and returned home to report his findings. The king and queen sent him back after only six months with the expressed purpose of establishing more permanent settlements. So what did Columbus think when he first saw the natives? Did enslave and brutalize the nice people he found? There are journal entries literally from him describing the natives being kind and bringing them things, having no knowledge of guns so they'd be easy to enslave 
Okay, that is a lot to unpack. But this is something that people bring up all the time, that in his own words and in his own journals, he says this or that. The most common quotes are the ones he shows. So let's start with this one about them making good servants. What do you notice about this quote? How about the fact that it's neither the beginning nor the end of the sentence? There's clearly more to it. So we're gonna have to look it up. And here it is. It appears to me that the people are ingenious and would be good servants, and I am of the opinion that they would very readily become Christians, as they appear to have no religion. They very quickly learn such words as are spoken to them. In full context, the word servant could mean slave, or servant of God, or subject of the crown. When they just cut out the ingenious good servant part, it only means slave. They remove any context and any doubt. But these are Columbus's own words. We have to take them at face value since we can't figure out what he really really meant, right? Do you see where I'm going with this yet? These aren't his own words, because his real name wasn't Christopher Columbus, it was Cristoforo Colombo. Oh look, what do we have here? Yes, I really do have that kind of time on my hands. Here's what we're looking for from October 11, 1492. Now we have to translate it. Let's just shove it into Google Translate and see what we get. They must be good servants and of good wit that I see that very quickly he says everything he told them blah blah. Obviously Google isn't the best translator since it doesn't carry meaning very well, but it takes some linguistic gymnastics to get from they must be good servants and of good wit to the people are ingenious and would be good servants. They pick the absolute worst, most biased translation to quote as journal entries literally from him. Fun fact, the Italian translation of his journals don't have the word servant at all. Instead, they translate it as servant of God or... For more on how bias can influence how the same words can be translated to mean wildly different things, might I suggest watching the movie Arrival. I'm not gonna walk you through the process for every single quote, but there is another one people like to refer to. I could conquer the whole of them with 50 men and govern them as I please. Here's the Spanish, and here's what Google Translate says. Because with 50 men, they are all subjugated, and it will make them do everything they want? Okay, that ending doesn't really make all that much sense, but I can tell you what it doesn't say. Conquer them and govern them as I please. But just to be sure, let's look at a different translation of the same quote. For with 50 men, they can all be subjugated and made to do what is required of them. The words conquer or govern don't appear here either. Again, they pick the worst possible translation to highlight. Again, in full context, in this section, Columbus is asking the king and queen what they want done with the natives, suggesting that 50 men would be all that's required to hold the island. There is nothing about governing them as he pleases. And while we have Columbus's journals open, there's one more thing I'd like to point out. Let's say I brought a bunch of Indians back to Europe to show off, uh, and most of them died on the boat ride over, because that's true, I did that, that happened. Just say that you only meant to bring six in the first place. Okay, well, let's see what he has to say in his own words. Conveniently, the sentence in question is right after the first quote we looked at. If it please our Lord, I intend at my return to carry home six of them to your highnesses that they may learn our language. This was written two months before his journey home. So unless they're implying that Columbus had a time machine and was able to change what he said from the start. Seventh incorrect claim. When Columbus said they'd make good servants, he meant slaves. The colonies he set up operated with the encomienda system, a system of servitude defined by the Oxford English Dictionary as a grant by the Spanish crown to a colonist in America, conferring the right to demand tribute and forced labor from the Indian inhabitants of an area. From Thought Company, in the Americas, the first encomiendas were handed out by Christopher Columbus in the Caribbean. It goes on to say, the natives were supposed to provide tribute in the form of gold or silver crops and foodstuffs, animals such as pigs or llamas, or anything else the land produced. The natives could also be made to work for a certain amount of time, say, on a sugarcane plantation or in a mine. In return, the owner, or encomendero, was responsible for the well-being of his subjects and was to see it that they were converted and educated about Christianity. This was originally established under the Spanish Inquisition as part of the Reconquista system of the Conquistadores. They used it as a conversion system for Muslims, you know, in context of the Ottomans knowing worse here brought up earlier. And we're all too happy to use it on the natives as well. But don't let that stop you from plugging a thing into Google Translate and declaring victory. Especially then, going on to make a dumb statement. Like, 
it takes some linguistic gymnastics to get from they must be good servants and of good wit to the people are ingenious and would make good servants. No, it doesn't. Those are basically the same sentences. And with 50 men they are all subjugated is the same as I could conquer them all with 50 men and govern them as I please. Almost like you're trying to fill time by making the translations seem uncharitable, but can't actually increase the charitability by using yours. Almost like this whole point is bullshit. And by the way, uh, the ending would make much more sense if you didn't use the universally panned Google Translate. Pro tip, speak to a Spaniard before making videos about Spain. And by the way, Government and conquering are the same as subjugation too, especially when dealing with conquistadores using the reconquista system of encomienda to force Indians to become Christian and serve your crown. I mean, the only real substantive point you've made so far is about the six of them part. But go on. And there's yet another aspect to this that I want to bring up. None of Columbus's original journals survive. All we have are transcriptions of his journal written by someone who's probably already been mentioned in the comments below. Bartolome de las Casas. People often incorrectly say that Las Casas traveled with Columbus. Nope, he arrived in April 1502 with Nicolas de Ovando, three months before Columbus's fourth voyage arrived in the New World. As far as we can tell, they never crossed paths. Bartolome de las Casas was a noble who was given an en encomienda in the New World. Encomienda was the Spanish feudal system of lords and peasants. And that's what the natives were. Peasants, not slaves. Columbus wanted to subjugate them, which means turn them into subjects of the crown, not enslave them. They were forced to work against their will, but nobody owned them. Nobody could buy or sell them. In 1515, Las Casas gave up his encomienda and advocated instead for the use of African slaves. That's right, the protector of the natives, as he would later be called, advocated for the transatlantic slave trade, which then started under Nicolas de Havando, not Columbus. He slaughtered the opposition and became the progenitor of the transatlantic slave trade. And not his son either. But Diego has built on my work with the Indians, helping to found a triangular trade route that represents the world's first multinational process streamlining the transatlantic free labor market, insourcing African workers. In 1530, he transcribed Columbus's journals, and then in 1542, he wrote a short account of the destruction of the Indies, which is the thing that a lot of people point to as Las Casas saying Columbus was evil. He only mentions Columbus once, and it's rather neutral, really. The account is about the people who followed Columbus, most notably De Avando, who is best known for his brutal treatment of the native Taino people of Hispaniola. Keep that in mind, it becomes important later. Columbus was removed as governor of Hispaniola in 1500, and put in jail. Not because of his brutal treatment of the natives, but because of his mismanagement of the colony, which meant that he wasn't extracting enough gold, and because of complaints from the Spanish colonists. Eighth incorrect claim. Slaves are people forced to work against their will, and this point is such garbage, it lights itself on fire. It's an automatic dumpster fire. We should use it as an energy source, because in 1542, King Chuck of Spain would call it both government and slavery and abolish it, you absolute ass clown. The fact that he was ousted for not enslaving them well enough doesn't mean it's not a plantation operating slavery. And by the way, free men can choose not to work. These were not free men. Literally never speak again if this is what comes out. The fact that he was complaining doesn't change the fact that it happened under his oversight and by his approval. His letter to the crown changes anything not. The fact that it was translated by someone you suspect changes it not. The fact is, he said these things. And your personal bias toward your interpretation of Google Translate's generally bad translation changes it not. Neither. But feel free to say that an AI knows better than a Spaniard and continue to poison your opponent's well as evidence. Fallacies are just as much fun as fact, after all. Chop off people's hands. 
cut off people's noses and hands unless they give you silver, right? He was doing that to the Spanish. I'm sure he also did that to the natives, but the king and queen didn't really care about the natives at this point. But his punishment was that he was removed as governor and put in jail for a total of six weeks, after which he was given everything back and sent out on his fourth voyage. So you can see how much they really cared about punishing him. But it was while he was arrested that he wrote an important letter. Girls as young as nine years old were sold into sexual slavery. My customers wanted New World sex slaves, and I heard them. Actual Christopher Columbus quote. That actual Christopher Columbus quote comes from that important letter I just mentioned, where he complains about the robbing and sexual slavery of natives, which is why he cut off colonists' hands and noses, and that the violence of the calumny of turbulent persons has injured me more than my services have profited me, which is a bad example for the present and the future. Am I saying that Columbus was a good person? No. But am I saying that he was against the very thing that people say he was for? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Yes. They're quoting his complaint about something happening and saying he was doing it. That's... Talk about taking something out of context. So Columbus was not governor when Las Casas arrived. Las Casas had already given up his encomienda and started the slave trade by the time he transcribed Columbus's journals. So at this point, he has every incentive to make Columbus look as bad as possible. In fact, it's common knowledge that he paraphrased and exaggerated. This is made even worse by Black Legend, which is a propaganda campaign by English historians to make the Spanish look much worse than they really were. So when people say from Columbus's own journals, what they really mean is from one specific 1892 English translation of the 1530 transcripts of Columbus's journals, originally written 40 years earlier. I hate to draw this comparison, but it's kind of like directly quoting Jesus. He didn't speak English. What you're actually reading is a centuries-old translation of a third-person account of what he said, written hundreds of years afterwards. Oh yeah, that's another thing. Those original transcripts and even the translations of Columbus's journals are written in third person too. Columbus's regime was so senselessly brutal that by 1542, the Taino population on the island had fallen to 200. <clears throat> As we've already established, Columbus's regime only lasted until 1500. Adam is attributing an entire 50 year span to one person, 42 of which weren't even under Columbus. Do you even remember who the president was 42 years ago? De Avando, who was the most brutal if you remember, was in charge for longer than Columbus. 50 years is a long time, that's two or three generations. Not only was Columbus dead, but his kids were dead. I mentioned this in my Oregon Trail video, but this is another example of someone taking something that occurred over decades and compressing it down to blame it all on one guy. 50 years is twice as long as the Oregon Trail was in use. So okay, something else that really stuck out to me is that 200 number. No matter what source you look up, you'll see the 1542 population numbers around 2,000 to 5,000. Which is still small, don't get me wrong, but it's 10 to 25 times larger than what Adam says. So where did he get this? Here. By 1542, there were fewer than 200. But wait a second, did you notice something? Here, Adam says that the Taino population in 1492 was 250,000, which is pretty accurate to what most everyone else says. But in Adam's source, it says the population was 1.1 million, which is ridiculous. So don't use the source when the numbers are wildly unbelievable, but go ahead and use it when it fits your narrative, I guess. So how many people did Columbus and his men kill, and does that count as genocide? If we take that 250,000 number and subtract the 90% mortality rate from disease, the answer is that it doesn't matter. That's not what genocide means. In 2012, George Zimmerman shot and killed Trayvon Martin. That fact is beyond dispute, but he was found innocent. How is that possible? Because he was tried for murder, not manslaughter. Murder requires an intent to kill. Zimmerman didn't leave his house that morning saying, I'm gonna kill a black kid today. Proving intent when the only witness is the perpetrator is nearly impossible, and intent matters when we're trying to define a crime. After the Vegas shooting a few months ago, many people wanted the crime labeled as an act of terrorism. Terrorism is the use of violence or the fear of violence to further a political agenda. There was no stated political purpose or message behind the shooting, it was just a senseless mass murder. The intent is what matters. So when we look at what happened with Columbus and his men, there's no denying that mass killings took place. I am not trying to deny, excuse, or minimize what happened. 
But when trying to label the crime as genocide, we have to look at the intent. Genocide, as defined by the UN, is an act committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group. Columbus's intent was not to wipe them out. All of them. In his own words, he wanted to subjugate them. It wasn't racially or ethnically motivated, it was conquest motivated, and those who resisted were killed. When Napoleon was trying to take over Europe, he killed hundreds of thousands, and we don't call that genocide. The end result is the same, whether we're talking about Trayvon Martin, the Vegas shooting, or Columbus. People were killed, and that's awful. But when trying to label a crime as manslaughter, murder, terrorism, or genocide, it's the intent that matters. And we're up to ninth incorrect claim. Adam wasn't attributing the Taino's death to one person. He said Columbus's regime was to blame, and they were. The policies he set up did result in that number. Now, yes, his misuse of sources was a problem, but your disliking the source says nothing of its accuracy. In saying you're not trying to minimize it, it seems like that's all you're doing, especially when you take the definition of genocide, which includes religions, something the Encomienda sought to homogenize, thus wiping out entire religious populations at the threat of conversion, cruelty, or death, and claim that's not what Columbus did. Intent doesn't matter. What matters is effect, and the effect was racial and religious subjugation. You literally just disproved yourself. But... Keep going, not long now. For centuries, Columbus was a historical footnote, but that changed in 1828 when Washington Irving, the author of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow and other tall tales, wrote the first English language biography of Columbus. Historical footnote. Right. That's why this state capital, the district of the nation's capital, this state capital, and this territory were all named after him. Not to mention all of the other cities and counties in the U.S. and an entire country in South America. All before 1828. Truth is that Columbus and his imagined female goddess form Columbia have been part of the American story since the beginning. Here she is telling you to ration food during World War I, and here she is in the painting that you all know, even if you're not American, as the depiction of manifest destiny. Admittedly, American folklore has probably turned him into a bigger deal than he should be given his rather minimal involvement in U.S. history, which is why I personally don't think that we should have a day to celebrate him. But conversely, I also disagree with just renaming it Indigenous People's Day, because what is it really? Ah, uh, f*** yeah. yeah f Columbus. F*** Christopher Columbus. That's a big f*** you. It's just anti-Columbus Day. Think about it, what do people do on Indigenous Peoples Day? They hate Columbus, burn him in effigy, and hold mock trials of him. If you want to have a day where we celebrate native history and native cultures, then let's do that. Don't just name swap it and make it hate on Columbus Day. We don't have a day where we hate on objectively more evil people like Hitler or Stalin. It's weird. Was Columbus a good guy? No. Was he a bad guy? If we look at him through the historical lens, not really, he wasn't any worse than anyone else. But if we hold him up to modern standards, yeah, he was a pretty bad guy. Columbus is just one part, the first part, but a relatively small part in what happened to the Native Americans. So why do people hate Columbus? Or rather, why do people want to hate Columbus? Why do some people seem to exaggerate and in some cases fabricate evidence in order to discredit, downplay, and demonize him? Well, Wonder Woman got it right. Maybe people aren't always good. You don't think I wish I could tell you that it was one bad guy to blame? It's not! De Ovando was objectively worse, Cortez and the other conquistadors were objectively worse, and the US government, most of the time anyway, was objectively worse. But even more than that, all of the unnamed soldiers under these people were the absolute worst. But despite all of that, Columbus is the one that everyone can name. To many people, Columbus deserves none of the credit for discovering America, but all of the blame for what happened to it. If we can pin 400 years of awful history onto one guy, it shifts all of the guilt for what happened to the Native Americans away from the rest of us. Well, the rest of you, because my relatives didn't come over until after the close of the Indian Wars, so... Not me. Putting people into nice, neat little boxes of good and evil just isn't that simple. People are more complicated than that, and deep down we all know it. We just don't want it to be true. We want a villain to blame. And the next time someone tells you that Columbus was responsible for the genocide of millions, or they tell you that he thought that the world was shaped like a pear, hopefully now you know better. Your second correct claim 
is that Adam shouldn't have used Washington Irving the way he did. A little hacky. But most of your vid was extremely hacky, so there's that. Uh, like how you include a pic of Columbus with, you know, bison in it. In conclusion, I hate Columbus because he was a murderous, genocidal, enslaving, racist, religio-fascist piece of shit, and I was taught the opposite in school. That's the reason people hate Columbus the most. The lies, the deification, the apologism, and the fact that Adam's special, the cracked presentations, and more were news to a lot of people meant that not only were they betrayed by the education system, but robbed of all of the energy they spent supporting him. And that's just people who supported him. Plenty of natives don't like having their historically brutal treatment whitewashed. I'd hate that too, so it makes sense to change a day devoted to erasure of First Nations cultures to a day celebrating it, even if the people angry at its previous purpose say, fuck Columbus. But feel free to cry about that. I won't. And by the way, people don't blame all of America's evil on Columbus, nor do they ignore Cortez. I'd say citation needed, but you have none. People talk shit on Columbus because there's a day every year where banks and government buildings close to celebrate his bloody regime. Fuck that, and fuck Christopher.